Hello, everyone. This is Dave Goulas, president of EZDC 3PL, and thank you for tuning in to the Beyond Fulfillment podcast, where we spotlight small business owners, entrepreneurs, startup founders, and we have real conversations about their journey, what it's really like, and what they've learned along the way. Thank you and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Beyond Fulfillment podcast. I'm your host, Dave Goulas of EZDC 3PL. And this week, my guest is the founder and president of Esposito Intellectual Enterprises, Brian J. Esposito. Welcome, Brian. Hey, David. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Glad you could take the time. Um, if you would, uh, for everyone listening, can you just give us a, a quick uh, intro to, to your business journey and up to where you are now? Yeah, yeah, I'd be honored to. So it's uh, 23 plus years of my professional career, always as an entrepreneur. So that would be building, starting, acquiring, and growing companies. Uh, present day, I've built Esposito Intellectual Enterprises. It's a parent holding company of over 110 entities. It's over 200 joint ventures around the world and proudly operating over 25 different industries. So I tend to look at it like a uh, you know, a GE model of a parent umbrella company, multiple industry agnostics, holdings underneath it. And from my standpoint, great IP, technology, product solutions, and services in all these companies, exceptional management, running them and pushing them forward, and then giving those companies the tools, resources, and professional services they need to survive and grow and be successful. On August of 2023, I took over a public company known as Diamond Lake Minerals, and that's the ticker symbol is DLMI. So it's the evolution of my career, bringing all of my work, um, experience, relationships, and, and holdings over into the public uh, forum where I get to utilize that new vehicle to boost balance sheets, grow earnings, reward our shareholders with uh, growth and hopefully future dividend payments. And we've got a quite of interesting spotlight on us. I've got quite a um, career over the last decade or so of understanding digital assets, uh, launching things on as digital securities or security tokens. So our public company, DLMI, is a hybrid of traditional stock security meshed in what we believe the future of digital securities are in a, in a regulated environment. Okay. So that was a lot, but there you go. That's what I do. <laughs> that is a lot. That is a lot. Okay. So we'll dig into that too. And I, I uh, this is about Diamond Lake and, and the stuff you're doing there. Um, I wanted to start because you got your start in, in the beauty industry. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. In the late nineties, I built the first B2B, B2C e-commerce platform for beauty. I uh, taught myself how to code, great timing, launched throughout that um, company of 15, 16 years of launching and building and growing brands. Launched over 1,200 brands. We distributed them through our own stores, global distribution. I was first to be Amazon's Beauty Lux retailer, as I quickly realized they were going to be the go-to for everything in early 2000s. Then I was Jet.com's first retailer, uh, first to launch Google Wallet. Uh, so it was, you know, the beauty industry is a very interesting industry. It's recession-proof. It's proven to be pandemic-proof. Uh, so I've gotten very good through that, um, through those experiences on how to move product, uh, how to get product quickly into professional stylers' hands as well as the retail consumers quickly, correctly, and without damage as possible. Uh, so in my current holdings of all these companies, there's always the roadmap of launching products within them because that's something I'm very good at. And it's also a good medium for people to have a connection to a brand through some sort of product delivery system. Okay. Now, how'd you get, like, what made you get into beauty? I was, I think I was in the womb when uh, my dad was building uh, his beauty uh, company. So it was interesting with his career in that industry. He was a very famous stylist. He um, did a lot of famous people's hairs. He's had salons in uh, department stores during his career. But w what he did was really interesting. He was the first to open up stores where professionals and retail consumers could shop for beauty supplies. Uh, so um, through his career, he uh, had an exit to a large beauty company in the late 80s. Then when the non-compete ended, I took over a new vision of what, what we would be in the beauty industry and really start, start from fresh because all the brands that he had uh, when he was building his company, they were no longer exclusive. They were found in drugstores, uh, supermarkets. They were more accessible. So I had to really build a beauty company from scratch, getting really interesting brands, finding great brands that were hard to get, uh, where people could only come to us for them, and then also finding brands that had good price control. A lot of people 
that may not be in the industry, whatever the industry that you're in, if you're going to go and build a brand or launch a brand or become an affiliate of a brand, you want to make sure it's not being discounted by a bunch of sellers all over the world because then it's very difficult to move your product and then you're just basically trying to win on price and when you're trying to win on price, you lose on profitability. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if I read this correctly too, part of your inspiration for what you've built now and having ownership and control over all these different companies is within that beauty distributor, you were able to launch all these brands and propel them into spotlight and getting acquired. But because of the model, you didn't have any control. Yeah. Yeah. David, you're spot on. I, I hate to say biggest regret, but having launched all those brands, we were, and I, I don't like to say that those brands wouldn't have been successful without me or us. So I don't like to take that type of discussion, but I know we were instrumental in giving them credibility helping them move inventory, getting them distribution. So, And we were the, usually the first ones doing that because I always love to find brands that weren't well-known, but I knew be from the founder having so much passion, the branding, the pricing. the I could just take a look at a product and know if it's going to be successful or not. Um, so being the first one to do that and helping them, again, get that exposure and, and, and uh, momentum, uh, I was happy at the time, I, I tend to call my career in the beauty industry early on as an ant farm, where I was just product coming in, product going out, product coming in, product going out. And my mindset was I was happy and honored to just have the brand and make my margins on selling it to retailers, selling it through other distribution channels. However, the problem was where I didn't learn quick enough, like you mentioned, Dave, when those brands had exits, and were bought by maybe L'Oreal, Revlon, Estee Lauder, LVMH for a lot of money. Uh, I didn't, had no attachment to the upside of that because I had no equity. And even worse, I lost the brand because other companies have their own distribution channels and models. And my mindset was, well, there's always a new beauty product coming out. Just keep filling the pipeline of, of products. And um, you know, then you lose one, you get one. So that's when, at one point, I think I saw a couple of brands sell for over a billion dollars, and we were their first distributor. I'm like, what the hell? This is something. <laughs> this isn't this isn't working for me anymore. So I said, that's it. You know, but you know, I had to stop people using my brain, my relationships, our access. You know, stuff that we do to really create momentum. And I flipped the script. So rather than people inviting me into their worlds and using me, and then me chasing them for crumbs or the empty promises. I had to get really scrappy and bring people into my world, who I wanted to work with, who I trusted, who I believed had good ethics and morals and business character or integrity. And uh, it was trial and error for a long time. Uh, but up until now, it's it's a great situation. I love everybody I work with. I love all the holdings that I get to have in our, um, in our uh, ecosystem. And um, just got to be smart not to let the wrong person in. It only takes one to disrupt everything. So that's what our, our biggest time spent is making sure we make the right decisions and work with the right people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the right people are everything in business for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, other thing, other thing that I think aligns with the 3PL world that you're very uh, tied into, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Uh, yep. Was my other biggest mistake was managing and controlling all my inventory. Um, stupid. It was stupid of me. I did that for over a decade where I woke up one morning and I hated our warehouses. I hated the, the entire, everything on those shelves. That's money tied up. I had all these employees focused on just packing and shipping orders. You know, our skill set, if I'm just focusing on the beauty company, should have just been as a marketing company, not as a full service beauty pack and ship and distribution company. Uh, going, you know, now we put those types of services into people's hands that that's what they do and that's what they're good at. And you have things like bigger buying power on shipping rates. You have, you know, you just, you're not really focused on the business of those products. You're focused on moving products. That's it. I should have been focused on the business of those products and not spending so much time and resources and energy on shipping those products. I mean, there, I miss birthdays. I miss holidays. I'd be in the warehouse on Thanksgiving all the way till, you know, almost Christmas Eve and just packing orders and packing orders. And I became a slave to that business. And the wrong use of my time, energy, and resources was a lot of it used up in, in the warehouse, in the shipping centers. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's so true. And that's something we see. One, one of our biggest uh, groups of clients that come in are people that are just graduating when they're doing fulfillment in-house and they graduate to, to moving it to a 3PL. And the biggest thing I say to people is when, because it is, it's before I got into it too, I, I thought I knew fulfillment and there's a whole other world that you don't know. It's all about efficiency and processes and, and ability to scale. But when you're able to outsource that to an expert, you can free up so much mental bandwidth to actually do what you're good at that's where we see people really take off and scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, you brought up a, another interesting point about working with the right founders and uh, being that someone that invests in so many different companies. I've heard this from other angel investors to where even if they don't fully understand the industry or the business, if if they have confidence in the founder, they can feel good about making an investment. I mean, do how do you relate? Like what's more important in terms of like the business itself or the founder? Yeah, my model is very unique because I built it because nobody else really did what I needed. So I'm embedded with these companies. I'm not passive anymore. And sometimes the money comes secondary because I try to help these companies do what you know, old school business philosophy is make revenues, not just raise money and run out of money and raise money and run out of money. Go out and earn. And what is your business? And are you pricing your business correctly? And you can only do that with the right founder and the right mentality. So there's a lot of variables with psychological um you know, the mentality of of a founder and, and it's got to be the right timing too sometimes founders get intimidated by me and i'm as accessible and kind and approachable as possible but they want to kind of peacock with me and show me that they know more and they may but i don't have time for that like i want to i want people to put their guns on the table and say All right, how are we going to work together how are we going to build this business and how are we going to make you successful I'm a I'm a entrepreneur and a founder at heart. So when I have those discussions with founders or management teams, I can be on both sides of the table because I know what they need because I needed that building my companies and growing my companies. And it's very hard to find the right caliber of person that's really there to support you and be in the trenches with you through good times and bad and don't have any ulterior motives. And you know, when people see that that's my genuine DNA, I don't have no ulterior motives except us all to win. And I'm not here to be a Shark Tank guy and get all of your equity and rob from you and, and beat you up. I'm here to give you the support and guidance that I believe that you need because you just put your life and name and credit on the line. You took a second mortgage on your home. All your credit cards are maxed out. Your home life is stressful. Like You are all in on your business. I have been there many times in hell and back and it's a terrible place to be it's debilitating at times and you're looking for help anywhere you can find it so being a light for those people and opening up a door that changes their world that means everything to me and and the money is secondary to that the money's a byproduct of us getting down to work us making some really good tangible moves moving the needle on your business and getting you in motion and once that happens with the right caliber person because I refuse to do that with people that are materialistic, greedy, and have obsessive egos. I cannot work with those people because their motives are just trying to have really nice things. And their motives are to be, throw, uh, show fancy stuff on their social media about their nice things. I don't subscribe to that. Um, I want people to have nice things. I want people to earn and feel good about themselves. But if that is your God or your North Star, you're not going to use me to accomplish those things because you're going to put me in harm's way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that that kind of leads into another one of your posts, which I love. Um, it's an article you wrote, actually, where your health is your wealth. And uh, I'm I'm a big health nut. So I said, oh, let me read this and see what he says. And it, it's a little different than what I, I thought, because some of the key points you made in that article is, is mental health and being happy with less and putting your phone down, disconnecting from social media and spending time working within your unique gift. Yeah. Can you just elaborate on like, because especially today, I mean, the information overload, the digital hijack of our minds and and just the stress level that you see in everyday life with everyone being so wired and so connected all the time. Like how, how am, can you just elaborate on like what you wrote in that article? Yeah. I mean, the, I could always speak on my own experiences. So for me, I know stress and worrying about things that are out of my control and you know, we all go through hell um, and more money doesn't mean less problems. 
And throughout my history, as a, at a young age, as a young entrepreneur, I've gotten things like Bell's palsy. I've given myself shingles. I recently had to get my gallbladder taken out. I know these are all things that result in the stress and the aggravation and the turmoil that I mentally gave myself worrying about things. And what I, when I boiled it all down, because I'm very self-aware, I always try to work on myself. I'm not far from perfect, but I try to be a little bit better each day. And I realized so much of my stresses and daily anxiety and in my sleep nightmares about the day and then the day coming uh, when I wake up was always, a, was always stemmed from other people. And I had to have this epiphany moment where, okay, I, I need to fire people from my life, not just work and employees, but like mentally fire people that are toxic, that were really causing me so much angst in my life and so much uh, ner unsettling nerves. And it's hard to do, right? Sometimes it can be family. Sometimes you got to put family in the corner. It could be your best friend. It could be whatever. I realize if people aren't adding positive good energy to my life within reason because everybody I also want to be a, an outlet for people to vent to if they're having a rough day like I want to help people but if you're constantly si uh, siphoning energy and my soul and my good vibes out of my body heart mind and soul that you gotta go you just have to go I'm sorry welcome to come back when you're on a better you know on a better beat and you're and you're in a good place but I had too much responsibilities that I had to stop letting people affect me. And I never blamed people for that. We're all wired uniquely. We all have our own good and bad and ugly. I blame myself for allowing those people into my life and allowing those people to negatively affect me. So that's why I'm very passionate about your mental health and wellness because I do believe it can make you very sick, speaking firsthand. And I do believe it can actually get, make you feel better once you start to really feel good about yourself and you put this um, really high level of importance on simplicity of life. Now you look at my world and some of the things you might read, it looks like it's, it looks like, I don't know, maybe it looks massive, maybe it looks arrogant, I don't know what it may look like, but to me, it's all wonderful, good people and really great companies that I believe in and all working together to make a difference. They're all working together to employ people, to make an impact on the world, to create and to build value and to just do good. There's nothing in this system that is made to hurt people or destroy things or to just make money. It's it, it, it's all all these things stem from a good, genuine place, and the, and that's my foundation now. Um, and you need to as as hard as you can, like the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. It stems back well before I was even born as as a term, but it's on steroids with things like social media. It it's it really is a barrier for entrepreneurs because I, I, I hate when people don't feel good about great accomplishments. They don't feel good about great accomplishments because they're comparing themselves to a, a LinkedIn article they read where some firm raised a billion dollars and they're not even making any money. And there they are that made $10,000 that month and they think they're a failure. I hate that. If you're out there and you're earning and you're creating, and you're creating some sort of a Anybody that's buying your products, signing up for your service, uh, licensing your IP, whatever it may be, if you're if you're creating that moment and you're getting some value back for the work that you've done, you should feel amazing about yourself. So you got to stop comparing yourself to other people. You got to stop chasing things and other people's things and other people's lifestyles and look inward and you know look at these milestone moments or these baby steps that you've done throughout your day, your month, your career where you've come so far. I think people need to take a moment and be proud of themselves and acknowledge their accomplishments because you can't ever feel good if you wake up comparing yourself to Elon Musk every day. You're going to feel like a <laughs> failure for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, I mean, that's that's something. And it's so it's almost like social media is engineered to do that, right, to 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 get you to do that. And, um, you know, the algorithms and all that. But like you said, when you when you unplug from that and, and look for more simplicity, it's where you can find true happiness. Yeah, no, I really agree. Um, the other thing about uh, social media is it's an important aspect of our lives, especially look at, like look what it's done to help brands explode if it wasn't for that new medium 
so many items wouldn't have taken off. So many wealthy influencers wouldn't have careers now. It's just, it's an amazing thing when you use it correctly and not to use it as a weapon to attack yourself. That's that's where it gets really crappy when people are just sitting there scrolling and every time they swipe up a little bit, um, they're feeling worse and worse about themselves. And that's that's a that's you need to get off that hamster wheel. Yeah. Um, another question. So being that you're, uh, you have equity in 110 companies or so, and like you said, you're so accessible and so willing to be hands-on. I mean, for any entrepreneur, time management or self-management is so important. Like how, how do you manage that many companies and relationships and transactions? I'm sure that, that take place. I get this question a lot. And, um, you know, a lot of people do one one thing and they do it well and that's their lane and they focus on that. I've always done better with a lot going on in my brain. So the more dots in my brain, the more things I can connect. And it's just the way that I'm wired. Where, where I explain to people time and then my private company motto is time is our most precious commodity. So it's very important to my daily routine is where time's being spent, who it's being spent with and how it's being spent on. Um, and this is an arrogant thing to say, but it's the reality. After 23 years of you know, uh, sourcing the world for good caliber people that are effective, I get a lot more done in an hour than some people may get done in a week, a month, or even a year. Because when I take a moment to do a task, for example, or if one of our companies needs something done or they want to be introduced to somebody, Odds are I'm one degree from whoever I need to introduce them to, and it's directly to a decision maker. So it's something that came, I, I say it on and off the plate in my life. Uh, when this discussion's over, look on my phone, I'll see what came in, and those things will get boom, boom, boom answered and right out. So there's always very good fluidity, fluidity to the work that we're doing, and no busy work, no... Um, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to cold cold sell something into another company like I'll go right to where it needs to go with a quick yes or no with uh, with guidance and support around whatever actions need to get done. So, you know, long story very long, it's it's just surrounding yourself with really good support systems that are there to help you and navigate you. Obviously, delegating things is extremely important. Uh, but again, it took me 23 plus years to, to figure this out. I mean, my time management, if you were to ask me 10 years ago, was, and even even if I thought it was good, it was nowhere near the efficiencies that it is today because I've, I've learned, I've evolved, I've filtered out so much noise and chaos and processes that didn't make sense. And now it's really exciting. I can find a company or a company can come to me that's maybe in disarray or a little bit lost and I just drop it in our world and it finds it finds itself it finds value and it, it gets it gets i always use the word momentum it gets momentum and it's the best thing in the world but it doesn't happen overnight you know, these are things that took me decades to do these are you know saying happy easter happy hanukkah merry christmas to people for every year over and over and over again until maybe one day i needed that person's help or assistance but you know you got to nurture those relationships and Thankfully, that's what I do and do very well. That is very time consuming. But when it comes to answer your question about time management, when I need something done, those relationships that I nurtured immediately get done. Okay. You mentioned routine. That's something that I'm very big on as far as like a morning routine and, and especially early part of the day. That's where I'm best kind of flow state routine. But do, do you have any specifics that you do that have been very helpful to your, your process? Uh, my routine is simple black Starbucks coffee every every day for a long time uh, and right to work. I wake up with you know my mind knowing what I need to focus on that day. I need to start doing more focus on my um, physical you know well-being. That's something that I always put secondary um, because it, my passion is work. My hobby is work. My life is work. So that's where I focus my time and my, my routine on. So, you know, I've, I've been actively altering that a little bit. Um, but again, my, my heart and my mind doesn't want to disconnect from all these great companies and great work we're doing. So uh, that, that's my happiest place to be. Do I need to be in a gym? 
most likely, yeah. Do I need to be on a pickleball court like everybody is now? Yeah, that probably will help me feel a little bit better. But I'd rather be on a phone helping somebody grow their business. Okay. Wow. All right. So when you had that epiphany in the beauty business too, in terms of taking more control and going to where you are now with like 110 companies, like what was the process like in the beginning when you knew you wanted to have equity and ownership and going from maybe one or two companies to where you are now? Like how, how did you start the process and start scaling that out to invest in all these different companies? That was very expensive process and a lot of trial and error. I was putting money blindly into companies at first, um, passively. You may hear that term. Uh, that never worked. Uh, that's why I have an active role in, in all these companies because I need to know that the company's got some fiduciary responsibility, the money's being spent appropriately, they're doing everything they can to grow the business. That's why when you drop somebody like me into a company, you know, I really can help support their vision, but I can also throw in some channels or new markets or ideas that maybe they weren't even thinking about or didn't have access to. And you know, maybe their use case that they were focused on is secondary to something that's even bigger and better for that company. Uh, so, you know, that's where I got to today, but early on lost a lot of investments, um, again, because I was just believing in the people and, and the idea rather than them having my support, which is probably more important than just the money. And then, then I had to learn about, okay, well, I'm the value. How do you, what's the formula to pricing me as far as equity that I would earn? And that would be, what am I worth to that company? What is that company worth before they meet me? What is that company worth as they are working with me and as we grow? And that took some time because I never really asked for anything in my career. I'm the one people usually ask me things for, and I'm the stupid one that usually had my hand and wallet and heart out. Uh, so, you know, probably early on, I, I didn't price myself correctly and got, got less than I should have gotten, but still it was part of the process. And that's how I got to today where I make it really easy for people to bring me on because I want to see people earn and grow. The only thing I don't want to see is me take being taken advantage and me not having um, not being valued for my time and my work and my efforts. So, if company A wants to work with me, they reach out to me and they write up a proposal. What does a package look like? I don't care what it starts at because I just need it to grow. I need it to grow as I'm performing as we're working. There has to be an idea that this is where I end up after year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. But I need to have some starting point that's fair, that allows me to have uh, speak on behalf of the company as an equity holder, and then it allows me to work with the company internally as a member of the management team and as an equity holder. Uh, so that's where we, we evolved to, but early on, made every mistake you can probably think of uh, and lost a ton of money, but that's part of the deal. Yeah, and one, uh, one of my other guests, too, gave the formula of fail as fast as you can, because you learn so much from failure. You really just got to jump in and do it, fall on your face, get back up. I mean, do you, do you subscribe to that, that same theory? Uh, yeah, I had to. It's, that was my, not, that's not just my theory. That's been my life, but I don't really use, I, once you stop breathing, you fail. The, the failure word is activated because you have no more chances or choices to do anything further. So I've never looked at anything as a failure or people as failures. I just look at it as, what what do I what am I gaining from this as an educational le lesson? What am I gaining from this as a moment where something may have been wrong with my model? You know, even to this day, if someone is able to infiltrate these systems I have in place and take advantage of me, uh, manage to get over on me, whatever the terminology you may want to use, I'm grateful because that's where my mentality is. I thank them for doing that because they taught me a vulnerability that I have, and I work on that to ensure that doesn't happen again. So. Everything in life happens for a reason. The, the crappy thing about times for myself, uh, for example, and a lot of people, is when you're in that tornado or that storm, you don't know which way's up. You don't know what's going on. You think everything is just upside down. When you get through it and you look back, there tends to always be a reason for all of that to happen. There tends to be this greater path or journey we're all actually on. And there's always the ability to do better, to grow, to learn. Uh, but you have to be, you have to be open to that. You know, a lot of people don't like to 
look inward and say that they may be at fault for something or they may be wrong for something or they may have said or done or acted in in an inappropriate way a lot of people like to just point to other people and blame them and I, i don't subscribe to that i think whatever happens in your life good bad and ugly we are the reason for that outcome and if you want to keep repeating a consistent negative outcome then i don't think you're growing as a person i don't think you're evolving as a person and most likely people probably don't want to be around you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so true. And I'm sure you can relate, uh, like it as an entrepreneur is no matter whose fault it is, it's ultimately your fault, right? Like if, if it's your company. So, um, how, how hard was that over the years? Was that hard for you to get to that place of just, you know, just complete acceptance and being vulnerable and, and really being open with, you know, your mistakes or, or what, you know, what, what you have to learn from any given situation? Uh, I, th- I think because I know I'm an old soul, I've always been okay with that. What, what is hurtful is when you're vulnerable with people you care about and they use those vulnerabilities as a weapon against you. That, that was the worst part about me being who I am. So I've always been vulnerable and open. And I think that's people that do that. I think they're very strong people. And I think that's the best kind of people I want to work with. You just have to be careful who you're that vulnerable with and ensure that that information or that access or you know, whatever you're being vulnerable about isn't to people that can really do you harm in your personal life as well as your professional life. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a trust but verify um, type of term a lot of people use. I'm trusting to a fault. I believe people are all inherently good. Um, and I believe... There's really not any bad people in this world. We all just find ourselves in bad moments and bad decisions and and I think you can I think you can always become a better person. Um but you know, from my standpoint now with so much that I'm involved with, I have to be very careful about those vulnerabilities. And um and thankfully they're a lot less than they used to be because I have been so vulnerable and because I've worked on them and I've improved a lot of things that I needed to improve in my my brain and my heart and and who I am. So, I think the more vulnerable you are, the more strong you get on making those vulnerabilities disappear. Wow. Okay. Um, you mentioned some of the storms or tornadoes too that can accompany the the entrepreneurial journey. Can you share any any lessons or, or any examples of like a storm you went through and 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 yeah. what you did to get through it? I'm gonna need a, I'm gonna need about 25 hours of a discussion here. <laughs> uh, but I mean, the biggest storm I went through, and I'm again grateful for it. In 2016, um, a drunk driver hit me uh, head on in Nashville. Uh, it was four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, which shouldn't have happened, but it happened. Um, my, um, I shouldn't have walked away from that accident, which uh, gave me some further strength that I know I'm here for a reason. Um, but what ultimately happened in that action, it shook me so much. Um, and I had about 30 or so companies in my holdings. The beauty company was still the biggest asset and resource. Uh, but because my brain was a little rattled, I was dealing with post-concussion issues. My brain wasn't operating as it normally does fast and connecting things. Like I couldn't even, it took me a, a while to add two plus two. Like that's how, that's how weird it was. And um, unless you've had a concussion, you can't really explain that to people. It's 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 a bizarre feeling. Even when you turn your head, things are in slow motion, catching up to you. Uh, so I was, I, I couldn't work. I was done. Um, and what sucked was a lot of the people that I had around me, um, I, again, on me, I put those people there really not effective or, or good at what they do at all. I was the one doing everything. It was the deal maker, the one leveraging everything, the one putting my ass on the line the one constantly working to keep things going. When you pull that guy out, you know, or that gear out, the watch doesn't move anymore, right? Nothing happens. So what sucked about that, a lot of things was the people that I had around me, people that I co-signed for cars and homes and did everything I could to help people, they, they were nowhere to be found to help me. They were, once they realized the cow being me had no more milk, they just disappeared. Uh, so that was a shitty feeling. That was a really bad feeling. Um, a lot of other things happen. Um, you know, brands that I took from zero to hero, they wouldn't ship me product. They would say things like, Brian, what, what do you want us to do? We're not a bank. 
I'm like, well, that's funny because that was a bank for you when you were growing your business, but they wouldn't extend terms. Uh, lawsuits started coming in because bills weren't getting paid. So it was hell. It was absolute hell. Um, so I had a, I quickly realized this is this is probably going to be a good thing. I can't be bitter or angry about anything because that's going to even make it harder. Uh, wound up losing everything, going millions in debt, did not file for bankruptcy, and just said, I will figure this out, and I will claw through, and I will work through this and figure it out. Um, so long story, very long, very grateful that woman hit me because she could have hit somebody else and killed somebody, so I would take that hit. And secondly, I think my I know what I was building and the mini empire in my world that I was building was completely the wrong model. And it could never have been fixed, updated, or edited to the current model unless it was completely torn down and destroyed. Uh, so thanks again to that woman because she destroyed everything that I was building and I was able to build it better and bigger than it, I ever thought it would be. So it took a long time, it took up until recently to get some things paid back. I mean, it was a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of financial issues to to come back from but i even said to myself if i file for bankruptcy why would i do that i would i'm still going to pay people back that's not my demeanor so you know sue me and fight me i'm i'm going to pay you back i don't steal or, or, or hurt or rob from people sometimes things take a little bit longer uh to get back on track like i had to go through uh so that was the biggest biggest challenge of my life um, but again, grateful for it because hell, I got through it. And if I can get through that, I can get through anything. And when people are telling me they can't do it and let's say they're even and they can't do it, I'm like, listen, listen, guy or girl, you can do it because I was, I was deep in Dante's ninth circle of hell and I've managed to get through it and it, you can do it. You can push through it. And I'm not going to feel bad for you. I know where you're at, but you're in a hell of a better position than I was in my darkest hour. And if I can do it, you can do it. So now you you said, I, I realized this was going to be a good thing. When you're going through that moment, right, and the lawsuits are coming in and there's no money and people are turning on you and saying, we're not a bank and F you basically, right? And at that moment, did you have the awareness to say, well, this is going to be okay? Because oh, it's no. one thing now, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, but at no. that moment, like, how, how did you deal with like that? that situation i i just knew there's a lot of history in this in our lives like our human behavior is very repetitive you know we just have nicer technologies now and maybe different clothes but you know the repetitiveness of issues is is a common factor with humanity from disease to financial crises to conflict um so I, knowing that i said well okay you know everybody goes through ups and downs I probably minutes of sitting there feeling bad, bad about myself and angry. And I just shook it off. I said, I cannot add being angry, bitter, jaded um, to this formula. It would, it would it's not going to work. I, I just, I was, I was well aware knowing that I could not fight back if I was also fighting those emotions. It would, it would have been impossible because my value and what I believe people like about me and want to be around me is that. I'm kind. I'm, I think I'm funny here and there, and, and I'm I'm a light. So if I were to turn that light off and go into a room to try to earn money or to go and try and get a deal done, but I wasn't who I always was, I knew I would never get it done because people needed to want to be around me. Also, I needed to give off this um, confidence, not fake it till you make it. This confidence that I'm able to build things. Look at what I've built in my career. Yeah, I'm going through some crap right now, but it doesn't mean I'm not effective. And I, and now in my career, I want to work with people that have gotten their asses kicked. I want to work with people that have gotten so many bruises of life that they know how ugly it is out there. And I know that they fought back. Uh, it's fun to work with very successful, very famous athletes, entertainers, celebrities, all these people I get to work with. Yeah, that's fun. But it's really fun to know that I'm in the trenches with another warrior that doesn't give up, that's got my back, I got his or her six, and those are the people that I know I can accomplish anything with. Um, the other ones are just, I think, God's little bonuses to me when I get to work with a famous somebody. That Those are, those are exciting, uh, very beneficial times for the whole, um, but I'd rather be in the trenches with somebody that 
that life just kicked the shit out of me because I know what that feels like and that they're still a good person and that they fought back and and they know that they're here for a reason. Wow. Well said. Um, speaking of being funny and, uh, and being confident, I love this other post. Uh, I'll just paraphrase it, but it's, you know, you took over for a public company, uh, in Diamond Lake Minerals, and it was basically, Hey, how am I doing as CEO? And if, if I'm right within just a few months, stock price went from 35 cents to $4, 50 cents market cap went from 1 million to a hundred million in something like three or four months. Is is that accurate? Correct. Yeah, that's accurate. And now we're sitting at 150 million, uh, $5 and 18 cents stock from 35 cents. So we're, we've got some great momentum behind us. I'm, I'm not a stock expert, but th that sounds like a, a phenomenal return. I mean, how did you do that in, in such a short period of time? Yeah, it's lightning in a bottle. Uh, this happens when, again, you go through life's lessons you surround yourself with great people. If that company, as an example, I've gotten some tremendous relationships that are serving as our advisory board, their icons of their industry. Uh, names like Anthony Scaramucci, phenomenal guy you see on the media all the time, very heavy in um, um, fintech and Bitcoin advocator, uh, managing partner and owner of Skybridge Capital. Uh, Larry Namer, founder of ETV. Raul Liel, who was the CEO of Virgin Hotels for a decade, now the CEO of One Hotel and Baccarat Hotel. Uh, Mike Malik Sr., he brought gaming to the Native American reservations around the country. Him and the Illich family uh, partners in a lot of businesses like the, um, the Tigers, the Red Wings, Little Caesars Pizza. Agnes Budzine, who was chief operating officer for BlackRock for over a decade. Uh, instrumental in bringing uh, consensus and Ethereum forward as those uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies were, were evolving and going into the market. Uh, Brandon Fugel, I love him, a real estate mogul out of Salt Lake City, Utah, the owner of Skinwalker's Ranch, if you've watched that great show on the History Channel and Netflix. Uh, the list is amazing. Um, it's just uh, Marty Pompadour, who's uh, built Fox's business plan with Rupert Murdoch. He sits on the board of Brandstar. Just icons of industry so that has helped give great credibility and strength uh, to our company and the new strategy that I'm taking the business it's great timing because I've been through all the ups and downs of this blockchain crypto security token world where I live and play is in regulatory so working with the rules and regulations of the SEC so we have a traditional stock and we have these components that allow uh, legally allow things like digital assets and security tokens to be within our businesses. So we're the hybrid approach. The, we're for the people that trust stocks and we're for the people that believe that digital securities are the future. You know, we're the first of its kind to do this. I think most public companies, if not all of them, will replicate the model that we've created. And, um, and it's, it's my life's work. So I couldn't do this if this was my first rodeo. It would, the stock would probably be a penny. It would go the other way. Uh, but because I've been through so much and I understand strategy, I understand messaging and communicating what we're doing to a market and building great credibility and support around the market for what we're doing. You know, now we have to execute and perform and uh, have revenues flowing and paying out dividends and distribution to our shareholders. So I'm excited to get there with this company. Um, but that's what we've done. We've created quite a quite an amazing moment. And I think we're going to change the lives of a lot of people that we work with and that are part of our company. And is it just, you mentioned an incredible list of names there at this point in your career, having so many connections and relationships, is it just like the ability to, to pull from all these different industries and networks and know like, okay, we need this guy, we need this person we need. And just, you, you have, like you said, the experience and overcoming what you have and, all the different businesses are you just is that really where it's at right now where you have the ability to plug in all these different pieces and it's just the right combination yeah yeah i've become the kevin bacon of business where i'm one degree from anybody um or the six degrees of kevin bacon so the if you look at what i'm building too all these subsidiaries that we'll be building acquiring or starting and underneath the lmi's parent will have those amazing icons to pull their experiences and their relationships and their network to help support those companies to help them grow. Yeah, the humbling thing is that these people 
that are have joined us, they don't need to do this. Uh, they're well established and well off in their own careers. They're here because I have a relationship with them. They're here because they believe in me, and they're here because they want to support me, and and our shareholders, obviously. So that's the great thing about trying as hard as possible to always be a good, decent person and to have integrity. As I think at the end of the day, that's all you really have in this life is your integrity. Uh, I could not have pulled these types of people to come and join me and support what we're building here if I was a crappy person, uh, if I wasn't someone that they enjoyed being around or someone that they believed in. Uh, for them, it's it's not even, it's not the money for them. It's not the potential upside if we take this company and this stock continues to increase in value. It's it's that they believe in me and they believe that I'm going to probably do something pretty interesting. And maybe that something interesting helps them even stay relevant more as they go into their businesses. Maybe it opens up opportunities for their businesses. And I hope it does. I hope it's a two-way street. That's everything that I want in life and everything that I do. I want wins for everybody. I want win, 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 wins for everybody. Um, and that's what I love to position. I love positioning people in a moment where the timing is right, the market's right, and the support's right, and everybody can benefit with uh, some successful outcome. Wow. Okay. So with uh, we're brand new in, in 2024. Obviously, you just ran down what, what you're doing with Diamond Lake, and you have you know, 110 other companies and all the joint ventures. Like, what what are you most excited for this this coming up year? Uh, well, it's, you know, DLMI is the evolution of all my work, so I'm excited about where we're positioning that company. I'm excited for us to be um, a security or a stock in the market where all the wealth of the world that doesn't believe in things like crypto or these terms that they hear, they don't believe in NFTs, they, they don't want to put their information on a security token exchange or open up a new account. Uh, they might not trust the process, too many friction points. There's a lot of barriers to entry to get involved into digital assets. Uh, so, but what is interesting and why one of the biggest reasons why I took over this company as CEO is that people know how to buy a stock. They go on their Charles Schwab account, they call their broker. and I believe we're going to be a well-positioned entity that has great growth and great opportunities and are operating in security tokens in the digital asset space. So it's easy for someone to say, hey, I'm in digital assets. I don't have a MetaMask wallet or an NFT, but I own DLMI stock and they're doing all these great things with regulated digital securities. So us eliminating all that friction point. And the other thing that's exciting about the security tokens, if you are familiar with them or not, it allows for people all over the world to buy into a business, which has never been able to be done before. So if it wasn't for things like blockchain technology and smartphone devices for people to access those digital wallets, you can buy into any business that has a security token offering. You don't have to go through a brokerage firm. You don't have to be an accredited investor. So when you look at what that can do for the globe, for the first time ever, people will have access to actually have the potential to increase their wealth. They have the ability to be invited into something that they've always been pushed to the side about because they're not the one percenters of the world or they didn't get blessed with an IPO moment from their brokerage firm because they're a good account. Now, with what's happening, people have the ability to hopefully do good due diligence. You still got, there's still always risk, but you have a chance to buy into something that you never had a chance to buy into and there's a chance that the outcome could change your life or increase the, the household income and maybe make you breathe a little bit better, maybe make you sleep a little bit better at night because you had a chance to create some wealth. Uh, so that's what excites the hell out of me about where we're going and this whole decentralized approach about people now being able to play in the same field with everybody else. Okay. All right, and if people want to get in touch, whether it's business or, or just want to learn more, what, what's the best way for, for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, David, like, you know, I'm accessible. I typically just use X, formerly Twitter. I got to keep getting used to that. Uh, and LinkedIn, Brian J. Esposito, or my um, my full name on both of those. And Instagram and TikTok, same thing. But I'm always on LinkedIn. That's my uh, that's the place where I like to talk about all my journey and what, what we're doing. Uh, my corporate site's EIE.ROCKS, so EIE.ROCKS. And Diamond Lake Minerals, 
um, dot com is the parent company for the public company. Uh, and again, I'm always accessible. You can Google my name and easily find a way to connect with me, send me a message. I'm honored when people do. I always try to make myself available. And um, yeah, that's that's where you can find me. All right. All right. Well, well, there you have it. Thank you so much for being here, Brian. Really appreciate all the wisdom you shared and, and, and the stories and your journey. And uh, yeah, just excited to see what you do next. And that's all the time we have this week. We will see you next time. Thanks. Hello again, Dave Goulis here. Thank you for tuning in to the Beyond Fulfillment podcast. If you like what you heard on today's episode and you got value from it, please click the link below to subscribe so you'll be notified of future episodes when they drop. If you would like to be a guest on a future show, you can also click the link below or you can email us at info at beyondfulfillmentpodcast.com. That's info at beyondfulfillmentpodcast.com. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time.